Welcome to the Aerospace Executive Podcast, featuring in-depth conversations with executives, leaders, influencers, and journalists in this dynamic, high-stakes industry. Hosted by Craig Pickett, founder of Northstar Group, the boutique executive search firm for the aerospace industry. You'll learn how top aerospace executives are developing their people, competing for talent, overcoming challenges, and adjusting to industry trends to drive growth and profits. And now, let's join your host, Craig Pickett. Welcome to the Aerospace Executive Podcast. I'm Craig Pickett, president of North Star Group, the executive search firm focused on the aerospace and aviation industries. Today, we are talking turnarounds with Jeff Barger. Jeff is the CEO of Zodiac Seats U.S., and an amazing executive who's helped that facility go from underperforming manufacturing company to a high-functioning, well-oiled machine. Jeff, how are you? Good, Craig. How are you? I am good, thanks. What's happening down at Zodiac today? Uh, just uh, probably routine. I would describe it as just a routine production day. Uh, no, no big, uh, no, no, no problems or crises going on. So everything seems to be moving well. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, to join us. Um, you know, wanted to you know, really wanted to sit here and talk about your background and and some of the steps you take. Um, you know, with with turning businesses and how you've successfully done so for the last you know fifteen years. Um, you've got an incredible background with you know, finance, manufacturing, operations. In a, in a mix of industries ranging from aerospace and tires and a couple other things, how is uh, how's your background helped you? Well, I, you know, my undergrad degree uh, is in finance, and I started out my early career as a typically a finance support person to a manufacturing or operations team. Um, but my breadth of experiences across multiple industries, I think, has has better prepared me to lead and execute in a business environment. I've certainly uh, learned m- multiple ways to achieve goals uh, of, of the enterprise by, by having so many different experiences across you know the multiple industries. And then I've had the fortunate um, experience too of I've been around a couple of really strong operations leaders while I was a finance support uh, in a finance support role. So I, I was able to learn a lot. Um, from both those, those strong operations uh, leaders as well as being in multiple industries, you know. So I think the learning from from all of my career travels has has really helped set me up for where I'm at today. What um, you know, going back to your background, you you, you graduated with a finance degree, and most of your roles were were in finance. How did you go from? How did you make the transition from you know finance professional to manufacturing and operations professional? So I had. I had had a little bit of program management and project management experience in my early career as well. And when I was at Piper Aircraft back in the mid-2000s, I was approached by our CEO to lead a cross-functional team of my peer directors at that time to bring a derivative aircraft, a Piper Matrix, uh, to bring that aircraft to market on a very, very short timeline. And the I can remember my our CEO at the time telling me that the reason he was asking me to take on that role was based on the leadership that he had seen uh, over the last couple of years that I had exhibited. So, so I took over that kind of a program management type role. We we ultimately were able to design and flight test the aircraft and and reach FAA certification in a little under a year. And it was at that point in time, uh, after that bringing that product to market, I was approached to step out of finance completely and into the director of uh, manufacturing. And when I look back, I think that um, although that first, I think I, the first weekend, it was kind of uh, an uncomfortable or uneasy feeling. Once I moved into that role, I would say I've always described it as being a very natural transition. Yep. And when I when I look back on my career now, I think that's those experiences that that I, that I had at, at Piper have have really propelled 
uh, my career to the point where I'm at today. Now, you and I, I think you and I met when we were both at Gulfstream Aircraft together. And, uh, right. yeah, Forsman had bought that. Forsman Little had bought it. And, man, I don't think anybody was having a lot of fun right after that, uh, right after that, uh, that purchase. Um, you know, Gulfstream was troubled. Uh, yeah, everybody was all hands on deck to turn it around. Yeah. Did you, I don't know. I keep going back to Gulfstream and kind of what the environment that those guys, you know, I think ultimately what, what, what made Gulfstream the, the successful company was the, um, the culture of success that the management team instilled in everybody. Like, you know, we don't have a choice. We have to succeed at that. Did you did you did you pick up some of that when you were there, and has that carried on, or what do you you know? Yeah. I don't know. I, Actually, I keep I, I keep did. thinking back to those days. Yeah. So no, I did uh, pick up on that back in the early nineties. Um, it was some certainly some challenging times at Gulfstream, but then I think the new the new executive team that started to appear, I think around the ninety five ninety six time frame, I think really took that that company to the next level and helped establish a, to your point, a winning culture that I don't think had previously uh, existed. Certainly not to, to that level of strength that some of that new executive leadership brought in. Yeah, do, do you and see this? Do you, do you see companies with that? Yeah. You know, when you, you, when you go see a, a company, when you go look at a company now or you go evaluate which you know, the next role do you see do you see companies with that that kind of winning culture, or do you see them wanting that winning culture? What do you you know what do you see out there in the in the market in the in the industry? I think they, I think people in general you know want to win. I know that um, when I arrived here at Zodiac Seats US, uh, this company was was losing money. Um, a lot of seats programs were behind schedule, being delivered to Boeing and Airbus late to their assembly lines. And so what I typically look for when I go in is I, I, from day one, I begin to evaluate the talent, especially the talent on the incumbent staff that's, that's going to be a direct report to me. And then also uh, evaluating the culture. And so what we had here um, were, were several functional vice presidents that were just not strong leaders. And so ultimately, within the first four or five months, I believe, I, I actually uh, replaced half of the incumbent staff that I, that I inherited. And I looked for, you know, collaborative, cross-functional type leaders. Um, Zodiac Seats US back then had functional silos everywhere and a real lack of communication and the type of leaders I look for are, you know, collaborative, cross-functional in their experience base and their thinking, uh, and it's really helped propel us to where we are today. You know, about two, a little over two years into this, to, to go from losing money to becoming double-digit, you know, reach double-digit profitability uh, in the first 20 months. Um, yep. It really took off. But I, yeah, I think no. it's all about assembling. The right, the right team has to be assembled. Yeah, no, Zodiac was, I mean, hey, look, it's no, it's no secret, um, in the industry that, you know, Airbus, Boeing, your, your primary customers were, were pretty disappointed with performance, um, on the seat side. And, and they were pretty vocal about it in the press. And, um, you know, my guess is, my guess is it was kind of like, uh, hey, we got to find, you know, we got to find the right guy to get this thing in. How long did, you know, when you, when you got down to Texas and you started looking around, yeah, how long did it take you to figure out what needed what what what, what adjustments needed to be made? Um, it, it started happening, you know, uh, pretty fast. Um, just having been around a couple of other prior, you know, P and L roles and, and operations roles, but you know, our um, our fiscal year here runs uh, September one through August thirty one. So when I I started and really got started in January of sixteen. And at, at, at the end of February, which is halfway through the fiscal year, we were about $10 million in the red. But then with some of the, some of the actions of getting the, getting the programs back on schedule, stop, you know, or start to eliminate the expedited freight and, and the liquidated damage clauses that are in our contracts with Airbus and Boeing. So we started to make a little bit of money. And a profit in March, April timeframe, but um, we actually finished up that last six months 
we made about twenty nine million in a six month stretch to finish the year at uh, you know nineteen million of a profit uh, for that fiscal year, and then that that carried over into the the next fiscal year, which ended just this last August, in which we we tripled uh, that profit to about fifty seven million dollars, and and this is because of some of the issues with Boeing and Airbus, we were held back. Offerability wise, so the top line in the two years I've been here is down by about fifteen percent. What made you decide? I mean, you know, when you, when you were being recruited to that role, you know, what what made you decide you wanted it? I mean, you're you're looking at the company, you're like, hey, you know, struggling. A lot of people go, you know, can I turn this thing around? Does the management really have the the you know the wherewithal or the appetite? to do what needs to be done here, and then you come in and you look at it. What are the questions you asked? Um, just about, you know, your so, yeah, just, you know, to find out what they, you know, they thought of the leadership team that was in place when I arrived. I knew, obviously, this was a turnaround. I knew there was going to be some upgrading or top grading that needed to take place on that staff. Um, and, you know, what, what attracted me was the turnaround. I really... I, I like the the urgency and energy that comes with a, a turnaround, and then uh, the other it was a it was a larger, more complex environment because this is this is not build to print. This is a design and build operation because we design and certify all of our seats mm-hmm. right here in Gainesville, Texas, um, and and so it was the complexity of the business as well as the actual product itself that was very interesting to me. How big? How big is that facility down there? 600, 600, 700 people? Uh, no, it's actually we're at about uh, fourteen hundred people today here in Gainesville, and about another seven hundred down in Chihuahua, Mexico. Wow. And do you have is a union or uh, is it is it mostly union or non union? How did the uh, how did the workers how did the workers feel about your your plan to take to the next level? We we do have a uh, the hourly workforce is a union. It's a Teamsters union that's been in place for years and years. Uh, but they, they're they're a good group to work with. Um, mm-hmm. I think they just you know anytime you can make the hourly workforce feel like they're part of the business versus just a an employee ID number on a on a direct deposit stuff. I think you get just a lot more out of people when you when you involve them and include them and make them feel part of the business. Yeah, how did, did you? Is, is that what you did? Did you basically go down the floor and go, hey boys, we're boys and girls, we're we're all in this together. Yes, I do have. I do, I, I do a lot when I'm not traveling. Um, I, I spend you know some time, just some very random walks throughout the uh, floor, throughout the operations, uh, to to be able to talk with people. I also have town hall meetings about once a quarter, where I get in front of you know all the employees here, just to communicate what's going on with the business, uh, what are our customers saying about us. Um, and areas, you know, opportunities to continue to improve and get better. Yeah, did, I mean, were they were they pretty receptive? How, how did they feel when you when you first came in the in the office or the in the floor? Yeah, you know, were the uh, you know a lot of people are like you know, union. They they hear the mean that they hear union or teamsters. They're running for the uh, they're running for the hills. Other folks yeah. are like, hey, look, you know, you, you know, the, the union guys are people too, and everybody in general wants to do well. And it's all in it's all in how you embrace the teams. Um, yeah, what did you walk into? Yeah, how did you feel like when you walked into the floor? What was the environment like? So, because it had been behind schedule for so many months, and not really any strong leadership, it was a it was a pretty, I would say, cold reception. Um, but I've always tried to to lead by example and do what I say I'm going to do, and so. Over those first few months, when they saw actions taking place that I would, had previously been talking about, I think they started to really warm up and the trust really, really grew because they saw that I was doing exactly what I said I was going to set out to do. Yeah. And then once the trust builds, then all of a sudden they're kind of like, all right, Jeff, we're, we're, we're with you here. And right. They, do, they start to take the things that they, the stuff that they need to, they do the stuff that they need to do. For their own personal for success, right? That's where you really see the ownership starting to get traction at the operator level on the shop floor. 
did you guys put in any yeah you know, did you have to put in any special you know bonuses for the for the folks like you hear what you know the the debacle that United Airlines just went through with their their bonus program and then, you know but then you heard about you know what Gordon Bethune, Bethune did at Continental back in the day where it's like hey look if we you know if we achieve you know on time performance to this level everybody gets a bonus you know weekly and everybody yeah, all so- of a sudden started tracking their own metrics to make sure that everybody was rowing in the same direction did you did you put any programs like that no because their their wage is governed by the the collective bargaining agreement okay but, but what we did bring here is as we started to get cost out of the business uh, one thing that was really missing was employee recognition. So we have a much more robust employee recognition program now mm-hmm. that all employees, hourly or salary, are eligible for. And those awards are typically anywhere from 250 to $1,000. And, and so we have a, a small committee that kind of oversees, you know, the, the awards and, and what's going on and the contributions being made by these employees. And, and we, we put these, we, Typically, there's a we'll get together with their work cell or their team and highlight what the uh, accomplishment or achievement is, and then they they also receive a monetary award, and so that goes a long way. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's a I think the it's probably just the personal recognition that they want the most. The money, you know, money's nice to have, but just the recognition of you know, hey, good job is is huge. Right. So, where did you find? You mentioned that you changed over some of your team. When you started on board, and I think when you and I first started talking about Zodiac, you had mentioned, let's see, VP of Programs, CFO, and a couple others. How'd you go about making yeah. those changes? How'd you go about making those changes to, where, did you bring on people you, you, you knew and trusted, or did you, did you go out on the market and just find people that, you know, had the skill sets that you needed to help you get where you needed to go? It was a mix. I, so I, my vice president of quality, I had worked with him before at Piper Aircraft. So I, I knew what he would bring. And so I, I brought him on board. And then I found uh, in the local Dallas-Fort Worth area, I found a vice president of program management who was very, his his background is about, he's got a lot of years of work uh, experience and it's about a 50-50 split between operations and, and program management. So he brings a lot uh, to the team. And then my uh, vice president of operations, I was able to find him um, out of the automotive space. And okay. he has brought a, a, a different approach from from his automotive experiences. This is his first uh, his, his first. You know, career or job in the uh, in the aerospace and aviation, and then um, and the CFO uh, was actually found through a, another uh, recruiter that that that, I, that had recruited me to uh, GKN a few years ago, and and she knows you know what I'm looking for in that role has a really good understanding of of, of what I need from a from a CFO type support, and so she was able to help find. Again, it was a local guy from the Dallas Fort Worth market. So it's all of those have come together with the with the incumbent people, and the, what I what I've seen is a real uh, a real high level of team chemistry. So seldom there's there's only uh, seldom will will issues actually get escalated all the way to my level because they all work so well together. Right. Yeah. No. So your so all your VPs can kind of talk to each other and say, "All right, this is the goal," and they get it. What were you looking for when you when you when you brought your CFO on board? What were you know what made the difference between the person you wanted and the person that would have been your number two or number three choice? What was the defining factor there? I was I was looking for someone that that had an operational inclination or mindset from a finance perspective similar to some of my own experiences years ago in my career mm-hmm. and so I, I was looking for a, a, a finance person that could could speak to operations and okay. can, and deal with operational issues versus just a reporting after the fact of, of the numbers so I found somebody that I thought was similar to to my background some 10 years ago and it was it was attractive to me 
Yeah, what industry was it? Was, did they come out of aerospace or did uh, was? Uh, it, yeah, was some, it? some aerospace and uh, raw materials. Okay. So you could cost of capital and you know, was, was that yeah you know, kind of cost of capital you know inventory levels? <laughs> if you guys were work, were working stuff you know down the down the manufacturing floor. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, and we've made over the same two year window. Of, of returning this business to double digit profitability, we've reduced our working capital by well over thirty percent. So it's been very successful there as well. No, that's awesome. Now, when we first met, you were running, well, you had just taken over Oklahoma at Gulfstream, and I remember that was a big, right. that was a, another unionized shop, and and uh, some facilities down in Mexico, some in Oklahoma, and I think at the time they wanted to consolidate. A lot of that. Yeah. So I, when I when I came back to Gulfstream at that point in time, um, I was recruited by a former colleague there from Savannah who had been in operations, and he wanted me to be his finance resource over Oklahoma City and, and Mexicali. And the previous management teams at both of those locations, I can remember they had been there 10 or 12 years prior. So when we came in, it was all new management in Oklahoma City as well as Mexicali. And what we found or quickly discovered was there was a lot of duplication of effort between Oklahoma City with the sheet metal fabrication and, and down in Mexicali because the the skill set in Mexicali had grown from, from strictly wire harness assembly. And they were now starting to do sheet metal fabrication in Mexicali as well. So we worked with the landlord in Mexicali and, and came up with a new uh, long-term strategic lease because we did have a couple of buildings that were about to be the lease was about to run out and ultimately when we put the basic <clears throat> floor plan of that new building together we saw an opportunity that had open floor space actually and we had an opportunity to take a good bit of what was in Oklahoma City and move there uh-huh. and then some of the other smaller part fabrication we outsourced into the supply chain and so I think all of that took about a year but it it was the savings in just the labor rate alone between Oklahoma City and Mexicali was going to be north of twenty five million a year uh, of annual savings to Gulfstream. Wow! And so we ultimately consolidated those operations. So what's the first couple of things? So when you go into a business as a new business leader, what are you looking for? I mean, what, do you have a checklist that sort of says, "Hey, this is Jeff's checklist to you know to, to go down and." You know, how, how do you evaluate? Do you, is it a step-by-step thing? Is it kind of a peel back the onion, you know, a little bit at a time? Do you, uh, do you just have a gut feel where you need to look? People That's, come up and tell you that where the problems are. How do you, uh, how do you evaluate? It's, it's more of a peeling of the onion. A lot of, you know, questions, asking a lot of questions, looking at evaluating talent and the culture while trying to establish a daily cadence, such as a stand-up meeting. Um, and then look for, you know, problem resolution inside of 24 hours. And from there, we just, you just find opportunity after opportunity, I would say, you know, to, to drive the business forward. For instance, I'm a big believer in, um, you know, leading indicators versus lagging indicators. So, you know, when I arrived here, the seats were being shipped late. But what I found was we had, <clears throat> back in the January of 2016 time frame, I think we had close to 400 engineering drawings that were late. So it's not the supply chain. It's not the operator. It's the leading indicator of why is the engineering design coming late, because it puts pressure on the on the rest of the program. Yeah. What was the bottleneck? So, yeah, it's just a, it was a lack of basic ownership and accountability. And so we've since in, we've implemented here what we call the IPT culture. So we have integrated program teams in which the program manager is responsible for that program, but but that program manager has a cross-functional representation, engineering, quality, supply chain, et cetera, that are part of that team. And those teams meet sometimes weekly, sometimes two or three times a week, depending on what's going on with the program. And they, by having that level of, you know, the ownership and accountability down to these IPTs, we see 
uh, continue to improve performance overall. So, so you know, so what, what did you have? Basically, engineers who were just kind of, you know, floundering because of lack of leadership, which was causing the the drawings to be late. Was that you know? Yes, it was. It was that, as well as not only were they late, but we had about a thirty-five or forty percent um, change engineering change activity that was going on. So now we've been about twenty months. Of one hundred percent on time engineering design release and our change activities below three percent. So it was all about you know, putting that level of ownership down to the individual design engineers. Who was driving that change? Was it the customer coming to you and saying, Hey, look, we you know uh, you know, we we know we've already been down this path, but we want to make some changes and here you go, and that upset the whole Apple cart, or was it was it more of you know, just internal stuff? It was just internal stuff because once I learned we had that many late you know, engineering designs, you could see how compounding it is on the rest of the program. And if, right. if you've got, if you have change activity inside of your supplier's lead times, now you have other parts shortages issues going on and perhaps obsolete inventory. And then ultimately just trying to get all that product to the assembly line to build the seats and deliver them. So it was just, if, typically if you wait to see how many seats did we produce, Today, that's going to be a, a lagging indicator versus the leading indicator of is the engineering on time or not day one into a program. How are you looking at the people? I mean, are you, are you, are you, are you looking for the, when you're going down on the floor now, are you looking for the leader on the floor, be it the junior guy who can lead versus the senior guy who's been leading? Do you, do you make those changes? Uh, we've, happy to- we've had some. We've had some of the more junior people really step up over the last 24 months. Um, you know, I changed out, you know, half of my staff in those first few months, but if you look down one and two levels below, there's probably another, oh gosh, 50 or 60 people. And I don't, I don't think we've had, but maybe one involuntary termination. So my point is most of the players are the same as they were when I arrived here January of 16. It's just there was not enough leadership at the top. Right. No, I got you. It all, it all, you know, it's funny. I was reading, uh, I was reading this book by one of the, you know, the Navy SEALs. It's all the fat. And, um, I was reading this book by this guy who was talking about how the, you know, one boat crew was continually floundering and one boat crew was continually winning. And all they did was changed out the leader of the boat crews. And sure enough, the guys that were floundering went to winning, and the guys that were winning went to floundering. And it's like, okay, you know, we, we, we and it wasn't that the guy that was the floundering leader got terminated. It was, hey, look, we 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 had to work on some stuff with him, and ultimately, once we you know, would gave him some education and training that he needed, he became you know pretty good boat leader. So right, uh, right. it's it's all I guess it's all a function of how you look at things. Yeah, and we, we have invested in leadership, people skill training since I've been here because I really believe it's important. I think, again, the more you can be transparent with people and and make them feel a part of the business and, and, and make sure they know communications a two-way uh, street, not a one-way street, I think you just get that much more out of your people. How do you uh, how do you how do you teach people to lead? I mean, you you talk about the leadership training and stuff. How do you you know how do you guys teach your your junior people to lead and step up? You know, as, as far as you know, treating people with respect and dignity, uh, being open, being honest in communication or or fact finding when when dealing with problem resolution, and and most importantly to involve the operators on, you know, process improvements or defect eliminations uh, to always be uh, inclusive of the hourly workforce because you you just get so much more out of them. Yeah, there was one guy who was talking to me. He's like, hey, look, you know, one of the things you're a good friend of mine runs a business and and he was saying, hey, look, one of the things that you got to you got to focus on is your people will make mistakes and everybody does. And at the end of the day, you know, look, if somebody makes a mistake, Typically, it's not the end of the world. You just kind of counsel them through it, and you walk them through it, and you say, hey, look, I got your back if you make a mistake. And just by the fact that you let them know that you got their back, they'll step up and take you know, calculated risks, and they'll go a little bit further, 
and they'll they'll try to do a little bit more. Do you do you, you know, do you go by that philosophy at all, or what's your thoughts there? Yeah, I do actually, and we've seen because we've become so much more inclusive with the hourly workforce over the two plus years I've been here. We've seen a significant reduction in the number of grievances. Um, people, just the general morale, you can tell, is much more positive because now people, you know, we we just celebrated in the month of February. We now delivered our seats to Boeing. 100% on time for two consecutive years. And so we had a, a celebration about that uh, a week or so ago. So there's, there's, a, there's definitely a winning attitude here now. Mm-hmm. And, and these people are very proud of these, what I call these winning streaks of, of uh, you know, the 100% on time delivery. We've been 20 months, 20 consecutive months of on time, 100% on time delivery to Airbus. And all of that product goes out of here via ocean freight to France or Germany. We used to expedite a lot of that. So, and we share these these uh, these success stories with the workforce regularly. So, feeling that they're part of it and they're making a difference, and and knowing that we are, you know, we are winning, uh, very very important for the for the for the operation to continue to get better. Yeah, let's so let's take it a different level. You know, you you get your businesses that are run by you know, really smart people. Yeah, but lately, if you know, I was I was watching CNBC at lunch today, and they were talking about Armor All, or I'm sorry, not Armor All, Under Armour, and how it stumbled. And you, you see GE, um, you know, GE has stumbled, and, and my sense is that ultimately GE will be okay, but it's having a hiccup. You know, have you seen some patterns there? As well, to why the why thing. could why good companies you know stumble? Yeah, I think one thing that I'm always on the lookout for is complacency. So even though we've had a significant amount of success here over the last two years, it's it's my job, you know, to make sure that there's a sense of urgency every day. Um, continuous improvement is very, very important to me. So I think if you've, you've had a couple of years of successes, to me, the, the, the thing I watch for most is do, are people starting to get complacent? And if complacency sets in, I mean, you can, you're done. You can, uh, you can, you can fall off pretty quick. You always you know, it, it, fall it's faster you, than you rise. It's funny you say that. I don't know if you remember Joe Walker when he was at Gulfstream. Yeah. VP, v, yeah you remember Joe, you remember Joe, VP of sales at Gulfstream? And we were talking about, he and I were at lunch, we were talking about General Motors. And and at the time, their cars were like, you know, pretty average, if, if that. And 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 he had a theory for it. And he said, "Craig, here's the deal. Every time I go to GM, you know, you see the executive parking lot, and the executives all get a car, get a brand new car every six months, and all six months, and all they have to do is hang a tag in the mirror, and uh, you know, somebody comes along and washes that car. So they get in every day. They get into a brand new car." That's fresh and clean, and they drive it home, and then they drive it back to work. And they've they've lost total touch with you and I, who drive these things for six or seven years. And then, you know, heck, that conversation happened you know, twenty years ago, and we all see what you know, what's happened with you know General Motors. So I think it just comes into that. Yeah, you know, when management loses touch and becomes complacent, it right. It all goes downhill from there, and you can and it resonates throughout the business. So it's yeah, funny, think, you know, for us. It's the complacency that it, that, can, that I'm always on the lookout for, as well as we have to maintain an open line of communication and listen to those cus- these customers. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I, I guess you got tired of getting beat up on by Boeing and Airbus, and and ultimately at that point somebody started to listen. Am I correct? Right, and then, and then, you know the seats the seat space that we operate in with economy class seating is it's it's a competitive landscape. So it's very, very important that we maintain a close dialogue with these airline customers around the world and listen to what what's what's important to them. What is important to them? What do you yeah, what's the most important thing to your customer right now? You know, it's 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 interesting. We have you know some of the higher end customers around the world are they're looking for comfort um and living space. And then you have when we deal with some of the uh, the low cost airlines. Of course, it's price. 
So we have to we have to kind of balance that between depending on which customer we're in front of. Is that a hard but, you know, Our products, you know, our our products touch the airlines paying customers. No doubt. Yeah. Do they? Do you find that the you know the the differential between the the low cost carrier who wants a price and the the premium carrier who wants quality are they are they different in how they in how you deal with them? Is one more is one more challenging than the other? No, they they both present you know a challenge because uh, you know the, the low cost people it's it's thin margin programs there the the premium carriers focus you know on a lot on um, subjective quality like when they do their final cabin walk uh, we have to really manage those premium carriers and go back to what we call our first article inspection mm-hmm. meeting minutes where they bought the bought off the seats prior to us building production seats and delivering them so we have to we have to put we have to really manage those premium carriers so that so that things don't get out of hand with cosmetic or subjective type related quality issues. Gotcha. At what point did you realize that the yeah hey look yeah I've 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 got this thing going in the right direction the business has turned. Um, yeah did you did you have a day you know, hallelujah moment did it just kind of come and one day when your CFO brought you the numbers how did you how did you realize that you were making the right inputs. Probably around the July and August time frame of 2016 when we were we were really starting to see run rate savings add up as we were taking cost out of the business and our profit levels were growing. Uh, we were delivering already, you know, on time at that point. Uh, I knew the engineering design release was on time. Um, we had... We were we were getting more product out with fewer people on the uh, on the assembly lines because we were seeing the productivity rise. So I would, I would probably say those different KPIs that started showing up about eight months, nine months into this is what when I really stepped back and could see that it is really turning around. And then you just kind of said, "All right, we're we're on a good course. Let's keep it going." Right, and we've. We continue to keep a very uh, rigorous and disciplined approach to the day-to-day operation. So even though, you know, these are good times, we still, again, have a sense of urgency about us every day to make sure we're not, you know, being becoming complacent or pacing ourselves or, you know. So it's still a, a discipline and rigor process that we put ourselves through here on a daily basis. What's, so, you know, as you read through... You know, LinkedIn and the business articles, you know, a lot of the buzzwords now is leadership. And mm-hmm. from some people's point of view, they're like, you know, don't shoot your best employee. Um, you know, others are, if you don't quit your employee, you know, you, 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 you hear all the, you, know, you hear all the terms. Yeah. You know, what do you, what do you think? I mean, how do you, you know, what's your idea of leadership in the business? How do you get the, how do you get the very best out of everybody? Well, I think for I've been told, you know, multiple times here that that I have always done what I said I was going to do. And so I've I've followed through on, you know, the commitments I've made to the workforce or on changes that I wanted to drive. Um so people have seen that, you know, I would call it leading by example or you know, walking the talk, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um but I do believe in this case, uh this has been a big part of this turnaround has been just sheer leadership, and it's those. It's the fact that I brought in some new people that were the cross-functional, open, collaborative type people like myself, and then the incumbents have have come have really come around to that that approach to the transparent approach with the workforce, and then yeah. now, like I mentioned earlier, the the team chemistry is is just rock solid. Yeah, how do you deal with the how do you deal with the people though that you know and I always you know talk to people I'm like look leadership is always out there. It's just got to take you in the the direction you want to be led. And if you if 
you know, if you don't want to take, if you don't want to go in the direction they're taking you, just go somewhere else. How do you, right. you know, how do you, you know, not everybody in your team is going to be happy, and that's expected. No, how do you, do, how do you deal with that? How do you think about when that? I, when I first got here and started having some skip level meetings back in January, February, March of sixteen. I, I was I could t- I saw these functional silos everywhere, and there was a lot of finger pointing and blaming going on. And so I just was very open and very direct with the people I was had these skip level meetings with. And that is, you know, if, if you can't if you cannot add value in a cross functional team environment, you you probably will not be here much longer. I mean, it was just it was just that open and that direct and to the point. To get people's attention, yeah. Because I'm a big believer in in the team environment. Um, I wouldn't sacrifice a, a team for any one individual. You know, nobody's that good. I mean, that's uh, right. you know, like the the guy from uh, I'm trying to think, Harvey Schwartz from Goldman Sachs. You know, kind of gave an ultimatum. I get, you know, I get the top job or I leave. And you know, what a shock! The board of directors said, "You got to go." Mm-hmm. Um. You know, no matter how good you are, you can't give ultimatums that take it to the next level. And I guess everybody's replaceable. So right, part of being a leader right. is, hey, look, I'll be on board and I'll go where the business is going. Or, quite frankly, I'll go somewhere else. Right. Um, I'm a big believer in in the fact that everybody is replaceable. Yeah, and and I and I talk to people about that all the time. It's like, hey, look, if you know, you got to give the leader the chance to lead. And the business, the guy who's running the business, a chance to run the business. And if you don't want to, if you don't believe him, just go go somewhere else. It may not right. be the opportunity for you. So you know, I, I get, I hear you. Um, I think that's the biggest. Yeah, you know, everybody talks about you know the millennial generation, etc. I think everybody's just looking for kind of a fair shake and the ability to do well. And if right. you give them, the, if you give them that, they're, that's leadership. Right. So what? And so we, what's? Go ahead. I'm sorry. We we really pride ourselves here on on getting that feedback from our workforce about how fair and how level the playing field is. I think that's 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 very very important to keep everybody focused. Yeah. Do you hear? You know, it used to be back in the day. You know, and 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 I think pretty unfair to be honest with you. That you know, going back to the union environment, some people, like I said, they just they'll they'll run out the door when they hear it's a union environment. Have you found them to be, be be pretty easy to work with? I mean, what are the what are the biggest challenges if you're if you're an executive who's about ready to take over a a unionized shop? What are the uh, what are some of the bear traps that they're going to walk into? What are some of the opportunities they're going to walk into? Well, here they've been, I would say, relatively flexible to work with. Um, there's, you know, we we found where. We had some salary people that were moving parts and material, and so we just had to make sure that everyone understood the rules, you know, that, that that's an hourly job, and we don't want those grievances in the system. And then the other thing we did was we we just negotiated a new uh, three-year agreement and last September, and as soon as we had that um, approved, we pulled in all the supervisors and managers and went through all the different changes um, in the new agreement that were made. Mm-hmm. So we, we invested some training with the man with what's perceived as you know management, so that people are we don't make the same mistakes, we don't get the grievances that we once did to some two years ago. Mm-hmm. So we've just we've made our our uh, salary staff much more aware of and educated as it as it relates to the uh, union to the collective bargaining agreement. Gotcha, and and I take it the union leaders they they come to you and they kind of you know, I I take it you guys have a pretty good rapport as well, and that's probably one of the most essential things is to just develop good rapport with your shop leaders. Yeah, and I had I had two or three of the stewards actually thank me for taking that approach after last September about making people more aware of the new contract. No, awesome. So that's kind of one of the things you got to do is kind of come in and go all right. Yeah, you know, one of the I guess one of the proactive things you come in and say, all right, what's the contract? Take the leads aside. You know, where have we been successful? Where have we not been successful? And just take it from there. Obviously, mm-hmm. accentuate mm-hmm. the positive, right? Right, absolutely. So, what's the next thing? What, what, what are you guys going to do with Zodiac? Is it, is it market dominance? Is it uh, is there any such thing as market dominance? 
you know, what's well, your thoughts on Jack Welch? You know, be number be number one, number two, or get out. What uh, where do y'all want to be? I think we're you know we're still a premier player in the economy class seating. Uh, we have a couple of new products that we are soon to be bringing to market. Um, a couple of big, large uh, programs with a, a couple of premier or premium carriers that we we hope to have some uh, press release material on in the next month or two. So those there was there'll be some big wins if we if we're able to pull those off with our new products that we're bringing to market. How's the uh, how's the environment? I mean, uh, Boeing has got you know gajillion airplanes and backlog. Air, Airbus has got the same. What's yeah, the, so our, uh, what's the challenges do you see? Our next uh, generation economy class seat, we believe, is the lightest seat uh, in the industry. It's a uh, it's right at ten kilograms. So we really think it's going to be it's going to really propel us forward because. Is significantly lighter than what we believe our competitor seats are. Um, so we're we're working. We're still in discussions with both Boeing and Airbus about their single aisle production uh, ramp up rates that they are still considering. It's you know it's fifty and sixty plus airplanes a month. Um, so we see those as opportunities for us as well if they move to those increased production rates in the next couple of years. Yep. So fifty airplanes. So fifty airplanes a month times how many rows of seats? That's that's a lot of seats you guys got to build. Yeah, typically on a single aisle, we'll put depending on the layout of the airplane, we'll put somewhere around one hundred and eighty-five to about one ninety in the mid one nineties. Yeah, <laughs> that's a big number. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of seats for sure. That's that's a, that's a uh, that's a big. Uh, that's a big number. So, do you see the industry? Do you see? Do you still see the bull market in the industry that everybody else sees, or what? Uh, which Jeff saw? Well, uh, recently, I think the long haul is fair. Long haul airplanes are fairly stable right now. Although there's been a lot of discussion about the Airbus A380 program and how much longer that might, you know, extend. Um, but we do. Uh, I would say now, with the long haul being somewhat stable, and then of course there's this question mark as to what what rates will Boeing and Airbus actually climb to in their single aisle airplanes remains to be seen. Do you see much of a refurb market? Do you guys play in the refurb market? Yeah. Or? Oh yeah, yeah we do actually because um, there are several leasing companies around the world that are uh, regular customers of ours as well. So one of the things that that we put in place about seven or eight months ago to to differentiate ourselves um, from our competitors is we now we made the investment in some stock inventory and we've got some long term agreements in place with some key suppliers such as uh, leather suppliers so we're now able to commit to the market for those leasing companies that have airplanes coming back in off lease and they just want to put new seats in them and turn them back out on a, on a new lease. We now, uh, we can now provide seats within four weeks of receipt of order, which is up until this point, I don't think it's, it's been unheard of to get anything in probably less than four months. Was that your driver? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I we saw an opportunity to be faster to market, especially with the, with the leasing companies. And it's another, it's a nice revenue stream for us, um, and we've got the infrastructure in place, like I said, with our own investment and, and some key suppliers, that now we can actually turn seats in four weeks or less. That's um, that's pretty, and, and everybody obviously wants cheaper, faster, and lighter in the next day and age. So I take it the next generation of seats comes out, and you know, the leasing companies are like, hey, look, we can shave a couple pounds off each, uh, each row of seats. Um, yeah, we've got a more valuable seats, product to send out. Yeah, and these seats that typically go on lease deals are, are fairly simple seats. They're not very complex. They typically do not have any uh, IFE in them for in-flight entertainment. You know, so it's a it's a pretty simple seat that we that we've got ready to go to market. Like I said, in four weeks or less. What's the biggest challenge you see? Um. 
You know, it's it's probably uh, continuing to deal with <clears throat> the differences that we find between a Boeing and an Airbus, um, and and learning to be able to to meet their requirements because we can we've had examples where we've shipped a ship set of seats to Boeing and they've been perfect and then a week later we uh, the same seat goes to an Airbus and we've had issues at their final assembly line and vice versa so yep. for us it's continuing to 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 align ourselves with both Boeing and Airbus yeah Let's talk about the final, kind of the final subject. You have, people are talking about, you know, unemployment now is somewhere around 4%. Are you guys, how do you find the market? How's the talent pool out there? Young kids coming up, you know, older people retiring. Yeah. Uh, how, are you guys, how are you guys finding it? How are you dealing with it? So we have a, um, most of our hourly workforce, I believe, you know, lives within a, probably a 10 to 20 mile radius. Uh, but to give you a little geography, Gainesville is located, it's about a one hour drive north of Dallas Fort Worth International Airport. So, so it's not, it is a little bit farther out than just the suburbs. Yep. But, um, so, so the University of North Texas is about 30 miles away. We work with them a lot in their engineering school. Uh, we also have a, a pretty healthy uh, summer intern program that we look for cross functionally everything from engineering to supply chain to program management and we we last year we had three students in here from Embry Riddle uh, one of them I believe is um, is graduating in May and going to start to work here this summer so by by, by focusing on um, that intern program I think we're helping to create employees of the future because they they come here and they have a, a very positive summer experience working. Mm-hmm. here at this facility. So it is a little bit challenging at times with salary positions uh, because of the, the commute. Right. How about just the, te- how about just the, how about the guy, the touch, how about the guys that are just, you know, you know, building the stuff. There's a, you got a lot of metal bending in there. You got a lot of skilled labor. How are you yeah, finding the, the, uh, the skilled labor? Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we find that in this tri County area that we operate in, um, that's not as big of a challenge for us as it is sometimes on the more like a, a certification engineer. You know, if they live in Fort Worth, you know, it's it's a good commute. So, I mean, I live, you know, north of Fort Worth, but I still have about a, a 50 minute commute each way. It's fortunately it's opposite the traffic. So the traffic moves really well every morning and every evening, but, uh, but no, we, we, we stay in touch with um, a couple of local universities as well as work our summer intern program to try and develop those relationships for future employees. I mean, are you always bringing people in and kind of looking, you know, talking to them and saying, hey, I don't, I, I, I may or may not have anything now, but, but, but you know, let's have a conversation? Yeah, we're actually doing some of that now in engineering because of these couple of programs that we think we're in a good position to win in the next 30 to 60 days and I did not want we're already going through the the uh, interview and search process now mm-hmm. so that we have a have a pipeline of people that we've already interviewed and are have you know have agreed that they would be a, a good resource to bring on board at the right time so so we are doing some things like that to try to stay out in front of the challenges of a couple of new big you know large size programs yeah that's awesome so so we're coming up on uh yeah, about the about an hour's hour's time. We've actually gone over. Anything you want to? Is there anything we missed? Anything you want to talk about? That uh, yeah, you, you've had just uh, you know just a, a successful run at Zodiac, and it's actually been been great to see because uh, it's it's come a long way since you got there. You know, um, how yeah. do you sum, how do you summarize the you know, how do you summarize it all in like four or five four or five steps? Well, I would just, uh, first of all, you know, appreciate the time today um, and have enjoyed sharing some of the, the turnaround story of Zodiac Seats US with you. Uh, but I think it's about, it's about leadership, uh, people engagement, empowerment, and then ultimately uh, accountability that, that help propel businesses into, you know, higher levels of, of performance. Sort of like stick to the basics, right? Yeah, it's pretty much basics. I don't think this is rocket science. So <laughs> it's been pretty fundamental. Congratulations basics is a good word. 
Yeah, there you go. Congratulations on your, all your success, Jeff. We'll look forward to, to, to watching it more in the future. All right. Thanks a lot, Craig. All right, Jeff. All right, Jeff. 